hello, everybody, once again, for those who were here two sessions before. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sivina. Good afternoon, Tony. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm very, very proud to be here. First Web Summit, Rio de Janeiro, my hometown, with once again two amazing uh, CEO, two amazing people that I, I, I got the chance to talk in the backstage. Uh, such a good vibe, people with so, uh, in, so many interesting advices. Uh, Silvina, uh, Tony, be welcome to Web Summit, to Rio. Uh, I'd like to ask you to briefly introduce yourselves to the audience. Silvina, you first. Hi, thank you, Fabricio, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Silvina Moschini, I'm the uh, founder, the chairwoman, and the president of Unicorn. It's a tokenized security based in the US that invests in high growth potential startups. Tony? Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here in Rio at Web Summit. And uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, currently the CEO and founder of Oyster. We are a mission-driven company that enable any company to employ people anywhere in the world. We are here to remove the barriers in front of talent mobility. And the subject of our talk here is uh, home office, remote, remote working, and how to engage and retain the best employees. And Tony, uh, during the 2020 pandemic, we were driven to adopt home office. Could you explain why what was once a health necessity uh, has turned into a business necessity? Well, uh, I think it was a business opportunity. Opportunity, perfect. Uh, yeah. Because uh, some entrepreneurs have intentionally took that opportunity to redesign the way they work, uh, to redesign their cultures, and as a result, become talent magnets. Uh, take, for instance, Airbnb. Airbnb, when they announced their move to remote work, the traffic to their web, to their career page has increased five folds. Uh, in our case, Oyster, we receive over 13,000 job applications per month. So what did these leaders do to become talent magnet? Essentially, they, they, they focus on uh, building intentional culture that put trust at the center because people are not the, in the office anymore. So you have to be very intentional in building trust. They redesign their way they measure results. Instead of having result based on presence, now result is based on specific measurable goals. And they created intentional way of working. At Oyster, we call them the tools and the rules. So this is where we get to you know, SaaS tools. Uh, and and so, so they define how do you use this tool in what context. Uh, and that created massive amount of productivity, but also flexibility for people. And therefore, you know, who, who doesn't want to work for a company that trusts you, that make it clear what success looks like, and that train you and give you the tools to be successful no matter what they are? Like, everybody wants that. And companies who are able to seize that opportunity, they transform their businesses. Yeah, I, I'd want that. Yeah. And I, I remember back in 2014, I launched a company that I founded to solve one big problem. It was that women were dropping off the workforce because of lack of flexibility. It was at the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York. And when I was suggesting that uh, because of the lack of remote work, uh, work opportunities, the market was losing 51% of the women that with children couldn't find a flexible work opportunity that matches their life. And companies were not realizing of that. Then the pandemic came, and suddenly this need for working remote changed from being an option, a vitamin, to become an aspirin for business continuity. So it became the new, the new normal. And as Tony said, like when you think of working remotely, you have the opportunity to hire globally, find the best person for the job, regardless of any geographical barriers or gender. You have the opportunity to grow flexibly. So if you don't need a person to be full time, you can hire on demand. And you have the opportunity to scale your company as well 
based on the needs of your uh, organization. So as uh, Tony mentioned, it's also important to have transparency, to bring visibility and accountability and provide the tools for coordination. This is, has nothing to do with the culture or getting the job done or not. It's just you need to think on how to work differently if you want to engage with people that think that work is something that you do and not a place where you go to. And it's obviously more difficult for women because uh, usually women sit at home, take care of the kids. And how do you in Unicorn, and you're, you're like the first Latin American woman to lead a unicorn, you're a great example. Uh, how do you uh, uh, take measures at your company to, to empower, to reduce this gender gap? Different thing. One is uh, I have a fully distributed remote first organization, people all over the world. We build different nodes of talent based on the talent that is available in some regions. For example, in Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, we hire creative talent because the talent in the creative industry here is absolutely outstanding. In uh, Central and Eastern Europe, we hire a lot of developers, hardcore developers, because I run a security, among other companies, and we give them the opportunity to also be part of the company. Um, be part of the company doesn't mean philosophically that we are a team and we just, you know, share only a t-shirt, which is one of the things that we share. It's like they are shareholders of the company. So the success of the company is the success because we believe that we need to put the money where our mouth is and make every, every people a part of the company's success is one of the big and important strategies that we have for retention in addition to understanding what they want when it comes to working flexibly and trusting them based on the proof of delivery of the results and being also rating members and supporting, of course, the company goals. I just want to add that the choice of your SaaS tools to empower a culture of high collaboration and flexibility across the globe, we call it follow the sun because you can be on the other side of the world in the same team and still be effective. The, the choice of this technology enable you to tap into massive amount of the planetary diversity because suddenly you can hire somebody on the other side of the world in any team. Uh, so at Oyster, we are in 80 countries. We have over 110 nationalities. And we are 50% women across the business, including on the leadership team. Every, every woman on my team is a caregiver. Uh, and so, so it really unlocks vast amount of diversity. So the choice of your SaaS tools, uh, the way you design uh, your collaboration to make people effective, no matter what they are, they don't have to come to the office to be successful then you can reap massive amount of benefits. So uh, it's all about method, uh, uh, trust, and transparency, and having the good tools, the great best tools for, for a great performance. It, it also comes with a challenge for some managers, because in the past, people could get along with uh, not defining clear goals and deliverables. Mm -hmm. So managers in this uh, distributed scenario need to be much better at setting up expectations what a deliverable means, at what time, how it should look like. Because if you set up clear expectations, it's very easy to assess if someone is doing a good job. So at the end of the day, you just do something that you try and then do trial for hiring or retention of these people because you get the best performers and the people are given the opportunity to deliver. So they earn their trust. It's not like blind trust, like you shouldn't have like blind trust. It's trust based on accountability. And I think that makes yeah. the manager much better, but also gives the employees the opportunity or the contractors or the freelancers, because employees is a word that finally appears like, the, where are you based? Like I say, in my house. Like, <laughs> I don't know, in a Starbucks, depends on the day. In my kitchen. Yeah. In the kitchen. And talking about management and clear goals, uh, we, have, we had on prep talks and, and exchange of emails. Uh, we, we, we have this feeling that H&R services are not quite designed for everyone uh, inside the companies. How do, we, how do we rethink systems, not only for leaders, but for everybody in the company? Uh, I mean, first, let's be clear, you know, you cannot satisfy every person in the company, right? So you have to 
what's important is first to have the right intentions when you design these tools. Uh, and these intentions are around, uh, I want to make you productive, I want to make you successful, uh, I want to enable you to have a, a high level of well-being and flexibility. Uh, as long as these intentions are well communicated, then you can make change happen, right? And you don't have to satisfy every human being on the team. Um, secondly, you know, ask what is the role of leadership, right, in this case? The role of leadership is not to dictate how you work, but it's to model the way. So if you, as the leader of the team or the leader of the organization, you're not the best remote worker in adopting these tools, then don't expect that your team is going to adopt, right? So I am the CEO of the company. I have the pressure to be the best remote worker in the company, and my team has the pressure to be the best remote team in the company. Otherwise, it won't work. So people look up to you. Uh, so you have to model the way uh, from the top. Um, and thirdly, it's about measuring, right? So from a leadership standpoint, you have to measure whether your tooling strategy is effective. So uh, what do you measure? You measure engagement. Uh, of your team, you measure productivity, uh, you measure adoption uh, of these tools, and, uh, and you need to uh, drive a data-driven approach uh, to whether this tooling strategy is effective. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And Sylvia, in, in, in Unicoin, at the PEP talks, we were also talking with people uh, that were based in, in different countries, different cities. And how do you see your role as a leader uh, not only uh, the, uh, Unicoin, but a, 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 an inspiration for your team, because you, you don't you, you don't get to to, to, to have this uh, everyday talk, and you have to you don't get to go to the coffee. You you have to inspire remotely. How do you see that mission? That's a beautiful question. I um, I think that one of the things that it helped me grow uh, a lot as a leader was uh, the pandemic, because uh, it showed me the power of vulnerability. Uh, working under extreme circumstances was the wall collapsing and then the tech uh, wall uh, falling down and then the FTX uh, makes you very humble because it brings an, a, an enormous amount of stress and under these circumstances I think you embrace uh, either two roles. One is I'm the tough leader that is effective and is rough and distant, or you said like, I'm overwhelmed, I'm vulnerable, and I'm a human. And I think that one of the things that teach me uh, all these duress and crisis is that it works much better when you are vulnerable as a leader. You get much more from, from people. So for me, it was a, a very enriching situation. I, I also learned a lot about that, and, and I made my goal uh, to not make money. Money comes when you are doing the right thing. As Tony was saying, like when you lead purpose-driven companies, you do the right things and then the money comes. So as an entrepreneur, for me, my mission is to economically empower people, especially women, because uh, I think there is a gigantic opportunity of an unseen population that is extremely talented and if I can inspire with what I do, a woman to invest or a woman to start their business or a woman to find uh, a job. So as my father once told me, can become a princess, but a princess that built her own castle, I will get a very good job done as a CEO because I think that our superpower precisely lies in the power of being vulnera vulnerable because that keep us humble and keep us near people and keep us understanding through the empathy who our constituencies are. So it's still growing, it's still learning. Every day is a, is a new challenge because always the, the bar gets higher, but you know, work in process, I'm very, very honored and happy for that. Great, fantastic. Uh, and I bet you both have secrets to retain your talents and for attracting your talents. I really would like you to share just one with our audience. Uh, how do we keep people working? How do we bring the best people uh, without being present? My secret to attracting talent is to build 
a mission-driven business and make sure that people come to join me because they are here for more than a paycheck. They're here to be fulfilled. Uh, may, may I maybe add, because retaining is a different ball game, right, than attracting. Mm -hmm. So to retain them, especially the people who are here longer, especially after two or three years working for you, you have to give them a break. You have to give them time to recharge um, and then, and, then uh, and allow them really to, 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 to disconnect for a spirit of period of time and come back to work. I think this is becoming scientifically proven uh, that if you let people have a uh, certain time off, they can stay longer uh, with you. Sabina, what's a secret? <laughs> Become much more creative as well. Like you know, no one had a brilliant idea when they were like rushing and running. Like Newton had the idea. He asked me, he asked me about one idea, one <laughs> idea. So. One idea. That just comes. Uh, so uh, as it isn't all about salaries. It's not enough to to have the best salaries. It's not enough to pay a lot of money and make it fantastic promises to acquiring the best people. It isn't about salary. Oh, that's very 80s. Ah, okay, okay, okay. You know, C-Gen and, and millennials now, they want to have a competitive salary because, of course, with purpose, you cannot go and buy things at the supermarket. You cannot go on vacation. So the compensation should be there, but should be, you know, normal average to, to the market. But younger generations want much more than that. They want to work for a company that they feel proud of being part of that. They want to have a, a team, a community. They want to co-build with people. They are much better than, I think, my generation in which uh, we appreciate people from all over the world, different backgrounds, different nations. They want to, they were born with technology, so they know that the face time is the, uh, or the, a meet or the, uh, any kind of video conference is the new like get together and have a, a, a coffee that they do virtual coffee. But they also want to have the opportunity to uh, have additional benefits that now many companies like, for example, yesterday I invested in one uh, women-led entrepreneurs, actually three sisters from Peru called Holos, which is a company that provides health benefits and fitness benefits with a membership for freelancers. The type of things that in the past, if you were an independent uh, um, uh, professional, you couldn't have because benefits were very tied up to having an employer. And the idea of now having an employer is not an idea that is uh, extremely attractive for people uh, at a perhaps local level because you can work for someone in a full-time uh, uh, more as, as a, with a full-time contract that it's uh, international. It's just not an employee, it's a team member. So that's also changed. So these type of benefits are highly appreciated as well because they keep their mental health, they help them to, to access like fitness clubs and things like that and, and it's value because they give them respect that they are considered as a human being and not a, a productive machine. So I think that that also makes a difference. Tony? It's not only about money. It's about a feeling of being treated fairly and equally. And it is really hard to get that feeling when you're hiring people in one country. When you're hiring in 80 country, it requires a whole different strategy. So how we did it at Oyster is we divided the world into multiple zones and uh, created a transparent, publicly available uh, compensation data where for a specific role, specific location, a specific seniority, we give you a range, we get paid in. And then because we're a mission-driven company on a mission to make the world more equal, uh, we bias it toward emerging economies. So if you're an emerging economy, you get paid more as a percentage. Let's say we pay top of the market in an emerging market, top 90%, while in a developed country, we pay 50% of the market, right? So we're still an attractive employer, but we're not paying you know, 90% salaries. Uh, and it's really hard because 
it would have been much easier for my leadership team to have a non-transparent pay policy because you can go to somebody and say, well, how much do you want, right? They don't have the data to compare themselves to other people. And now everybody in the company can compare to anybody. So it, it requires not only a strategy, but also very effective leadership communication to make sure that people having that feeling of fairness and equality across 80 countries. Fantastic. So it shouldn't be a choice between being happy or getting well paid. Not at all. Getting good, well paid, it's a, a very important thing. It's just not the main driver because many people today, especially Generation C, will leave a lot of money on the table in exchange for flexibility. People want to work for companies that they can feel proud of, that they are contributing to society, that they have uh, equality policies, that if they have a compensation for a role, it's the same if it's a man or it's a woman or it's a non-binary person, so it's, it counts. Uh, it's also shouldn't go like below uh, the, because people need to pay for, for, for whatever responsibilities they, they have, but it's not definitely the most important driver, as it's not like it was in the past that people were to think of, I wanna have a job for the rest of my life, like, you know, in my uh, school years, like being an entrepreneur was plan B. What you do if you don't find a job or what you do in between jobs. It was never thought as the first option. Now when you see millennials or Gen Z, they wanna work independently. They wanna work for either a, an employer that gives them flexibility or have different clients, um, build their own uh, a independent, perhaps like a solo company. Uh, having different clients that will provide for, for their income. They, they think totally differently. And as entrepreneurs uh, trying to attract the best talent, we need to do a good job at understanding how they think so we can hire the best people that are uh, the best people for us, but also uh, we are the best partner, the best employment partner for, for them as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you all. Have a great show. Thank you for having us. Thank you.